So today, I'm going to talk to you um, basically uh, about data, AI, and tokens. It's a bit of a generalization, actually, of two talks you saw earlier today. One of them, Chris just talking about self-driving cars and data, and an earlier talk as well from Michaela on the data commons. Uh, it's a project that we have in BigChainDB, following up from the POC to actually deploy something real for the world in production. Let's get started. Um, and another just quick comment. Um, this is a picture of a jellyfish, or a few, as you might imagine. But don't you think if an AI was an animal, it would be a jellyfish? These just like look like AIs. So keep that in mind as we're going through. Um, uh, jellyfish have basically become our mascot for ocean. Um, pretty appropriate. So let's get started. AI and data and a few more pretty mascots. What you see in front of you is Earth's largest jewelry store. It has billions of necklaces for sale. And you might ask, how, right? Um, interestingly, it was done by a friend of mine on the side. You know, his day, day job was NASA. His um, night job was or beaming. And so how does some NASA researcher on the side create a marketplace with billions of necklaces? The answer is AI. So every single one of these designs that you see here is actually generated with AI, uh, in this case, uh, simulated evolution. Uh, if you click on a jewelry piece that you like, uh, it will generate 10 more, 100 more. And you can click, click, click. And when you get something you like, you can click buy. It will 3D print it and send it to your house. So this is an example of modern AI, creative AI. Um, and it's just one example. Obviously, there are many, many. AI actually has been advancing a lot over the years. Um, for many, many years, from the 50s all the way through to the mid-2000s, um, typically what you would do as an AI researcher is you'd get your data set of maybe you know, 10,000 samples, 20,000 samples, and then you would play with it, trying to make a better algorithm, trying to improve things by 5%, 10%. I know I did this in my first job um, where they paid me to do AI research in the, in the late 90s. Um, I had a data set of 20,000 points, and I was playing with it, trying to improve things, and I managed to improve the accuracy from 65 to 70%. And I was pretty proud of myself, um, but if you think about it, that still means you have 30% error, right? You can't deploy that in the real world. And this is actually how people basically um, conducted AI research for years and years. But then along came um, a study. This was actually from 2001 um, out of Microsoft. And what they found was the following. Let's see if this pointer works. Great. So the x-axis is the number of data points, in this case, millions of words. And the y-axis is accuracy. And basically, uh, up until um, this time, everyone was playing around with just about 200,000 um, words. That's it, right? Um, and you know, they were c comparing their different pet algorithms with memory-based algorithms like key nearest neighbor, winnowing, perceptron, and naive Bayes. And you know, they were plus or minus 5% from each other. Um, but they all kind of were terrible, right? Like all, at best, 15% um, error. Um, but then these researchers, they said, you know what? Let's have 10x more data. And lo and behold, the accuracy went up. Let's have another 10x more data. And if you have 1,000x more data, you can pull the accuracy from 75% all the way to 95% or error um, from 25% to 5%, a 5x reduction. You're not changing the, al the algorithm at all. In fact, the algorithm doesn't even really matter. All of them work fine. It's actually kind of embarrassing to those AI researchers, including myself, who spend all this time, you know, man decades worth of work, um, researching the fancy new algorithm, only to find that what really made the difference was the data. Right? So um, Google researchers published a paper in the mid-2000s called The Unreasonable Effectiveness of Data. And this was what they, they um, noticed. You know, it's not about the algorithms, per se. They're a commodity. It's actually about the data. And since that time, Google has gone around buying satellite companies and a whole bunch of other things just to gather the data. What happened um, in the last five years is people realized, oh, these neural networks, which have been around since the 50s, we can make them much, much bigger. Instead of one or two hidden layers, we can have 100 hidden layers, 1,000. We can have millions of parameters. And you know what that does? it means you have way more capacity. You can start to have trillions of miles worth of self-driving cars driven. Um, and what this does overall is it allows you to keep going. So you have 1,000x more data yet, and you can get your error from 5% error down to 1%, 0.1%, 0.1%, 0.1%, 0.1%, 0.1%, 0.1%, 0.1%, 0.1%, 0.1%, 0.1%, 0.1%, 0.1%, 0.1%, 0.1%
0.01%, you know, one in a thousand, one in a million, one in a billion. And this is actually what we need for things like self-driving cars, right? Uh, so deep learning has enabled AI to get to the next level. And once again, it wasn't actually a change in the algorithms. These algorithms go back to the 50s. It was just about the data. So to summarize with all of this, we've got this set of um, uh, basically where you get value is if you have an AI algorithm and if you have data. If you ha just have data or if you have just an AI algorithm, well, good luck. You're not going to get something of value. But there's a problem, actually a few. Uh, from one framing, there's all these enterprises out there. Each of them have lots of data on their own, right? And then there's lots of AI startups these days, um, and they have AI expertise. They know how to deploy these algorithms and do a lot. But there's only a very small fraction of organizations in the world that have both, that have massive, massive amounts of data and know how to wield that into value using AI. What are their names? Google, Facebook, all of these platform companies that were just mentioned, right? Um, and they actually have what's called the data network effect. You get more data, you improve your accuracy, um, you um, increase the number of users, it loops, it loops, it loops, right? So more data, or more data, um, leads to more accuracy, leads to more money. This led The Economist, in an article earlier this year, to call data the world's most valuable resource, right? Uh, you might say, well, you know, in this economy of the modern world, where is the value? Where is there the scarcity? If you're a human, maybe it's your attention. But if you're an AI, it's the data. And, of course, this leads to problems. This is one of the big ones. Um, your personal data is sitting in various silos scattered through the Internet that you don't control. It's sitting inside Google, sitting inside Facebook, and all of this. Facebook itself actually buys data from 150 other feeds. Um, including credit card companies. I mean, the Equifax stuff is for free now, of course, but the rest. So basically, there's these massive data silos that are out there holding your personal data. How do you feel about that? Uh, my friend Lawrence Lundy actually um, su summarized this problem nicely in a tweet storm just a few days ago. The core problem is that silo we have the silos of data with no economic incentive to share. That latter part is very important, too, and we'll get to the solution soon but no economic incentive to share. So we've got this problem um, related to the interaction of AI and data. Let's put that in our back pocket for a second and talk about something else, and that is technology that is opinionated. It turns out, actually, that some technology has particularly powerful opinions. For example, uh, AI. There's actually two. There's AI and crypto. Did you know if you go to Google, and you type in creativity, Google image search. These are the images that it comes up with. And notice what they have. They have lots of pictures of people and brains with these ideas flowing over your head. But I just showed you guys at the beginning of the talk, you don't need humans to be creative. You can use AI. My PhD was on creative AI 10 years ago, uh, as Dimi uh, mentioned. So, um, and uh, so overall, uh, AI is actually going to the very heart of what is humanity. We have creative AI and all of these things. If you think your job is safe because you're a creative person, think again. Crypto is another technology that has particularly powerful opinions. Why? Because for the first time in history, we have a technology where defense is easier than offense. Normally, if you're going to attack something, um, uh, it's much easier to be the attacker than the defender. But crypto flips that on its head. So what we had before was basically this birdie that's sitting in the jaws of the crocodile, and you know it's pretty easy to get attacked. But crypto, um, with things like encryption and, and, and digital signatures, flips it around, where now you've got this fortress um, that's much, much harder to crack. And significantly, the little guy um, can wield it just as powerfully as the big guy. So technology itself has opinions. And in my opinion, <laughs> If you hear a developer say otherwise, they are absolutely wrong, right? So you can actually say it has opinions, you can design for the ethics, and then you actually end up with technology having a thoughtful approach to ethics. Or you can ignore them, you can say, oh, it's just code, but guess what? The code is not going to be opinionless, it's going to be bad design. So one example is, uh, in the world of blockchain, we have the talks on governance, right? So you can choose not to design for governance, right? But the result is actually not no governance, 
The result is bad governance. And we're seeing this emerging in some blockchain systems now. So you, we all have to understand that technology has opinions. And in, in particular, the technologies of AI and crypto have really strong opinions. Then what can you do as a technologist? Well, you really have to know yourself. You need, you need to think about your values as best as you can. Set your moral compass, right? And then use this to guide your work. Infuse your work with your values. And everyone has their own values, that's okay, but you better be thinking about this, right? And then with each new collaborative project, whether you're working on a data exchange or anything else, um, agree on those values up front with your collaborators. And I have a screenshot of some values um, from, from Ocean I'll be talking about. And I'll talk about that a little later, but this is actually super, super important. You need to be doing this at the beginning of each project and keep continuing as you go through. So the sort of call to action from my friend Yoda is, you know what you must do, young Paduan. Build positive, opinionated AI and crypto tech. I think that's actually a direct quote from Star Wars. Hopefully I don't have a copyright infringement. So towards the solution, we have this problem of data and AI data silos, control. We know that AI and crypto have very strong opinions as technologies. What can we do about it? Well, there's another insight um, that many people in the blockchain world talk about, um, this idea of a shelling point. And it's a, basically an equilibrium that you can arrive at, a common solution um, that you can arrive at in a community without anyone in the community talking to each other. And I'll, give it, um, I'll describe it more by example. Let's say that you uh, want to meet a stranger somewhere in New York. Um, well, and you haven't talked at, at all about where. Well, if you put yourself in their shoes, what's sort of the default place that they might think of? What's the default place that I might think of? And likely it's noon at Grand Central Station under the clock. And I just tested this earlier today. I said, if you were going to meet somewhere in New York, where would you be? And they, they said, actually, Grand Central Station under the clock. So this is pretty cool. Um, people can arrive at a solution and an equilibrium without communicating by kind of putting yourself in the shoes of others. That is a shelling point. This is the current shelling point for data on the internet. The shelling point is siloing more data. Why? Because siloing leads to more accuracy, leads to more money. What we need to do is change the shelling point. We need to change it so that it's about pooling the data, so that the economic equilibrium is benefiting those who pool the data rather than those who hoard the data. So here's um, a, a way to frame this. We've got all these enterprises with lots of data, each of them, and all these AI startups, and we need to bring them together. We need to connect these 1,000 plus enterprises with 1,000 plus startups, where all of them then have lots of data and AI, where they all have equal opportunities for the data. How? A data marketplace. It's the natural connective tissue between these, connecting the buyers and the sellers. And to sort of make this a bit more stack-like, you know, for the computer scientists and software engineers, we have a bunch of the folks that have data, the blue, and um, the, the bunch of the folks that have AI, that is, the AI that wants to eat the data, and the marketplace is the substrate by which all of them connect, the buyers and the sellers. Of course, if you have one marketplace, a single data storefront, it's kind of sitting there, right? Um, you can connect these folks. Is that going to work out? might be a bit lonely, but if it does really well, it could grow and grow and grow, and it could end up as one giant monolith, a single data storefront. But that's also a problem on its own, because it is centralized. Oops. Funny how that works, right? So we know that this idea of a marketplace is a good idea, but we want to avoid ending up with another centralized monolith. What do we do? We want data marketplaces. We want a bunch of them. We want them to flourish. We don't want the cathedral. We want the bazaar, right? Then you might ask, how? How do we encourage all of these marketplaces for data to come out there to flourish? And the answer is, you make it super low friction for them to exist, for them to connect to customers back and forth. You create a substrate for them, for a 1,000 marketplaces to bloom. And my favorite example for this is Sabre. So in the travel industry, there's this database called Sabre with Amadeus. And 
it holds all the data for all the different flights of the world. Um, if you're an airline, if you're Air Berlin, or if you're United, you put your data on there and you put your asking price. And then there's hundreds, even thousands of marketplaces that make this available in a whole bunch of different UXs. You've got Trivago, you've got Travelocity, you've got Expedia, you've got airberlin.com, all of these, right? And they're all accessing the same data. So Sabre and Amadeus actually are a substrate for the marketplaces buying and selling, in this case, airline tickets. What we need here with Ocean is Sabre for data. Make it really, really easy for these marketplaces to emerge, and they will. And of course, um, data is not just about buying and selling. Um, it's really important for humanity that as time goes on, we have this emergence of a data commons, data that is free for anyone to use, free for anyone to contribute. And we want to somehow incentivize that. And um, so rather than saying we only have pay data and ignoring the commons, which could compromise the pay data and they fight, or having just the commons data, which might be hard to pay for on its own, you really want to actually have them both sitting there side by side by side. So um, that's actually very, very important. And Mikel had talked about that this morning. So with this, we realized, OK, this is very important. Um, we need to have this substrate for data, data marketplaces. Uh, where can we go and start to build this and um, have some real world use cases? And right around when we were starting to really think seriously about this, um, we, were, we had the good fortune of, of Chris uh, Ballinger from Toyota, who just spoke, um, and said, hey, we are really interested in building a data exchange for self-driving car data. And uh, we said, great. It, and it's a win-win across the board. It's a win for humanity because, well, like Chris mentioned, uh, there are 1.2 million deaths in the year from auto accidents. And this is because of human error, et cetera. If you can actually get rid of the human error with AIs that are that much more accurate, great. It's also a win for the automakers themselves. It's a win for the passengers who have increased mobility, et cetera. So we set out and we built, um, working with Toyota, AVDEX, an autonomous vehicles data exchange. Um, so this is the, the landing page. And then uh, the inside, basically, you can upload data, and it gets hashed and all this, and you can set prices, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So we built this. Um, one of the developers, Alberto, are you here in the room? Um, no? Oh, there we go, in the back. Alberto was the, the main builder of this, so good job, Alberto. Um, this was our prototype, our minimum viable protocol for the AV decks. So we're pretty proud of that. And um, it, that really unlocked um, the next part. So this is AV decks. Then we said, OK, this is really cool. Um, how do we take this and run with it and make it real? Um, around the same time, another company reached out to us called Dex Singapore. Uh, Dex is short for data exchange. They had been a data exchange for the last three years in Singapore, and um, customers were reluctant to use them in many cases because they said, OK, well, we give you our data, but we no longer control it. They didn't like that, right? So Dex realized that what they needed was a substrate um, where Dex wasn't controlling the data, it could still be in the hands of, of, the, of the owner of the data. And so we started um, iterating with Dex, and the, the result is, is Ocean. So Ocean is a protocol for decentralized data marketplaces, and it's a network as well. We've been building it with Dex um, since almost the beginning of the year, quietly, slowly at first, ramping up, ramping up. And as you might have seen, we, re we only recently announced that we're working on it. So today I'm going to teach you with you, share with you um, some of the things we've been doing with Ocean and, and, um, from a technical side. So um, it's a tokenized ecosystem. Why? Because we want to incentivize people to put data in there. It turns out that design of tokenized ecosystems is kind of a black art right now. right? And I'm an engineer. Um, I, I'm, I'm a software engineer. I'm an electrical engineer. And uh, I, I went to go work on the token design with some of my colleagues and realized there wasn't really um, any structured way to do this that I could find. So I started doing it and was flailing a bit here and there. And as time went on, I managed to come up with my own uh, approach to, to do this. Um, I wouldn't call it a full-on engineering approach, but it's more than a recipe, so somewhere in between. And it's got seven steps. First of all, um, like I mentioned before, lay down the mission, the values, and the governance, right? Why are you doing this? What's important here? Then lay out the key use cases, the pricing. Then the stakeholders. Uh, what do they want? Uh, what can they give? What are the goals? What are you trying to incentivize for? And then a checklist. It's a set of ch um, checks to make sure that you've covered the basis. Then um, come up with candidate designs and then uh, see how they do. So let's go through these steps. So mission, the summary is, Ocean aims to unlock data 
for a more equitable outcome for owners and consumers of data, using a thoughtful application of both technology and governance. Uh, and there's a few key things in here. Um, the and governance is key. Um, you can't ignore governance. If you do, then you'll have bad governance. Um, it has to be both for the owners and the consumers of data. Um, and overall, it is actually about unlocking data, paid and commons data. How this drives into the values, um, this was very key to us too. And we had a whole list, and we, we chopped it down and chopped it down to what really mattered. So there's four values that really matter. Once again, the main is about unlocking data, making it ever more accessible to a broader range of organizations. There's human right to personal data privacy and consent. So uh, you have to make sure that you follow um, people's rights, and, and not only the rights, um, but the ethical and, and moral rights. And then spreading power and spreading value. We've seen many, many cases in the blockchain world where um, these ICOs happen and so on, or these token launches, are, but um, token whales end up owning um, the vast majority of, of these things. And that's really not very helpful, right? In the case of Bitcoin, we've got five or seven folks who actually control the vast majority of mining power. So overall, it's really important to spread the power um, as broadly as possible and have democratic ideals um, and transparent governance. Same thing with the value, right? Spread it among thousands, tens of thousands of folks. And beyond that, it's also very important we have to cover identity and reputation over anonymity, right? If you want to participate in the real world, then show your face, right? Um, I, there are times when anonymity is useful, but um, in, in this case, for when it comes to interacting with data, a lot of it is actually more useful to have identity. Sustainability, we don't want this thing to be a flash in the pan that lasts for a couple of years. We want it to be around for 50, 100, 500 years, right? And make no mistake, what is happening right now in the world of blockchains is laying the foundations for this next generation of internet infrastructure, building on the last generation with uh, TCPAP, with the World Wide Web, the DNS, like the keynote this morning talked about, and so on. And finally, working with the law and not against the law, right? This thing actually has to um, uh, acknowledge that there are data protection, data protection regulations here in Germany, here in Europe, throughout the world, and not only that, the other laws as well. So building bridges to existing societal norms, and Vinay had covered that a bit earlier. Governance. There's really two parts about governance. There's actually governance of the network and governance of whatever foundation there is. The foundation itself shouldn't necessarily fully control the network. So how we see it, the main part about governing the network is how do you update the protocol, right? Um, and you can have voting mechanisms that can be based on tokens, but once again, reconciling this ideal of one citizen, one vote. And the foundation is really about growing the community, right? Um, step two in this overall process is use cases. So with Ocean, we're really targeting two key use cases. Uh, autonomous vehicles, why? It's a really great driver, pun intended, for data commons and proprietary data. And then the second is medical data. Um, and in the case of medical data, the challenge is um, if you're trying to do data mining um, to build a model for, say, Parkinson's disease, normally you only have 100 or 1,000 patients to work from. Yet it's strange, right? There's actually millions of people out there that have um, these issues. Why can't you data mine that? Uh, and the reason traditionally has been privacy issues, right? So how do you reconcile privacy yet still um, data mining this? And it turns out that there are answers with technology. Um, this is also, of course, where medical, sorry, where data regulations come into play. So we're targeting these verticals so that we can reconcile the data commons, proprietary data, privacy, and data regulations. Pricing. We spent a lot of time thinking, okay, how should we price this, right? Um, and at first, you know, we wanted the commons, but how did it fit? And we realized in the end there's three types of um, ways to price, and they have to all be there. The free data, right, uh, for the data commons. Um, the non-free but fungible data. Um, so one mile driven in sunny Mountain View should be equivalent to another mile driven in sunny Mountain View. But of course, one mile driven in a blizzard in Saskatchewan should be worth way more, right? Because Saskatchewan is cooler, literally. Um, um, and then finally, uh, for the non-free, the price data, there's the non-fungible data, right? So, um, and that's basically the Saskatchewan mile versus the Mountain View mile. And with that, how do you price it? There's challenges. You could have a fixed price, uh, it's easy to onboard, but did you arrive at the right price? What about auctions? Um, what about royalties? And these are actually very nice, much, much more fair, and so on. And then finally, make it programmable, smart contract style. In, in terms of the stakeholders, we actually made a big list, about a dozen stakeholders. But there's really uh, four key ones, sorry, five. 
the providers and the consumers of the data, uh, the marketplaces to connect them, and the keepers. These are basically the miners that are running the nodes overall, um, but it's a generalization. Um, and then finally, the developers who build on this, right? So these are the ones you want to incentivize the most strongly. Overall goals, um, with the token design, the main point is to try to have a, a large number of data getting into the network. Once you have a very strong supply, the consumers will come, right? Um, there's huge latent demand in the world from AI startups and otherwise to have this data. Just the challenge has been getting the data in there, right? So you need to incentivize the priced data to supply more as well as to refer it. And you also want to make sure that you've got good spam pre prevention, right? We don't want someone to put data in there that they don't own, um, data in there that's just spammy and getting rewarded. For the free data, you want to do the same thing. This has the additional challenge here where um, if it's free, then how, um, you, you can't incentivize based on prices and data quality, so you have to do other things. And then uh, a key one that I learned is, this is actually pretty interesting, does the token give higher margin of value to users of the network versus just investors? So what does this mean? If someone is holding a token from this network, um, but they aren't using the network, um, we want them to basically be less incentivized than just the people who are using the network, and such that the people using the network get more and more value over time. And then there will be a natural equilibrium for all the users of the network to buy up all the tokens. And that's really good. It's more of a win-win rather than just speculators. So overall, um, it's really important to have higher margin of value to the users. And there's a lot of ways to do that. Um, stake in the skin in the game type things. Staking is a, a key way. Are people incentivized to run keepers? And finally, is it simple? With all these, the goals and so on, then we can basically make a checklist and say, OK, um, as we go through designs, then um, compare to the different checklists. So I took these seven goals. And you can see that there's a few different designs here. And each of them have yes or no and yes or no. And we have more designs. And you can see that this first design, it failed on one count. It was terrible for incentivizing data and not very good for spam prevent prevention of the free data as well. And it wasn't simple for onboarding. You know, by the time we got to design three, um, we were only um, half failing on two things, and some more recent designs are doing even better. So the overall software stack looks like the following. Um, we've got basically the, the consumers and the providers at the very top, and um, then the ecosystem, which is uh, consisting of the marketplaces for buying and selling, and then Ocean Network itself, which is the keepers running the nodes, and then talking to the storage and compute below, right? And once again, we have these thousand marketplaces blooming, right? That's kind of the core point. So these consumers are talking to the various marketplaces, but at the very, very core, we've got this saber for data. So each of the marketplaces is actually providing data that is um, down here, providing um, the, the, the price, the asks, all this sort of thing. And then to drill into what the Ocean Network itself looks like, it's the following. So, um, so the core software actually has several pieces, um, and then the storage and compute. So uh, I'll start from the very bottom, working to the top. So uh, we need reasonable identity in the network. If we don't, uh, we have tons of civil attacks, uh, people just having putting spam for data and lots of other things. So it turns out that there's a recent invention from the ad chain folks called a tokenized registry. And you can think of it like a whitelist for um, good actors, and I'll, I'll drill into that better, but uh, the good actors uh, uh, have tokens and they are incentivized to increase um, the, the list, the size of the list, to have more actors yet, and they're incentivized to only have more good actors, not bad actors, because that hurts the value of the list. The next level up is uh, data access registry. So what this is about is giving permission to see data yes or no whether it's stored um, on the cloud or on-premise even, encrypted behind a firewall if you want. And so we've actually, at BigchainDB, developed plug-in technology for that. I'll talk about that in a bit. On top of that, actually, is a tokenized curation market. So this is essentially a reputation system for data using our recent invention um, out of um, Ujo and Consensus, Simon de Lervier. Uh, and basically, it gives an automatic pricing scheme for reputation. And so you've got tokens to drive um, the value of the data up. If, if people believe that the data has value, they can stake it, they can put their money where their mouth is, and then if the data truly is used a lot, then um, they will actually get rewarded. So um, that is the third level, and then building on that, you can have we have pricing. So this is the registry of the bids and the asks, et cetera. The bids and the asks, of course, this is the, the auction-style pricing. 
And then at the very, very top is the API, right? So this is um, an HTTP uh, API. And, but it also includes what is the transaction model itself shaped like. So um, big chain DB is JSON. Um, but that JSON can have Rails on it. And in this case, the Rails are something called Koala IP. It's a protocol for IP that allows you to claim copyright and allows you to slice and dice uh, transferring of, of IP licensing for various jurisdictions, for various parties, and so on. This is something that we developed with um, several people over the last three years for uses in music and from our scribe days and so on. And we co-developed that with Ujo and the IPFS folks and the Koala folks and so on. Um, and so that basically is essentially the main building blocks of what is inside Ocean Core software. One builds on the next and the next. The users, the data access control, the reputation system, and then the pricing with an API on top. Under the hood, uh, it's leveraging several key building blocks in, in, in an overall stack. There is not one magical thing called blockchain. Instead, there's a database that stores the metadata and the token. There's the blob storage, which can be on-premise, and it's actually very important for many use cases. But it can also be um, out there in the cloud, decentralized or otherwise. So if you're decentralized, use Filecoin, for example. With business logic, um, we can have stateless and state-free. And uh, in this case, some of it is with BigChain. Some of it might be with Ethereum um, there. And finally, with the processing, uh, this is on-premise processing and so on. So once again, if you have data that is on-premise and it stays on-premise, then you need to have processing on-premise. And that's a very useful use case for all the medical and so on. So this is basically what the, the core software looks like. Um, to give you a feel of some of these building blocks, the tokenized read permissions, um, if you are a user creating transactions that go to BigChainDB, it basically looks like an extension to your existing transaction where you now specify uh, a couple extra parameters, and, um, and you have tokenized read permissions. And this is bringing ideas from uh, the Unix world, the database world, uh, into the blockchain world to make it really easy. And actually, with BigChain, we shipped um, this feature a few weeks ago. The next one is, let's see here, uh, this tokenized registry. And the core idea there, once again, is you have this white list of good actors, and they're incentivized to grow the list. So on the left, someone might propose that they want to join as a user. And um, they have to stake. So say they stake 300 tokens. And uh, if they get in, then they get that, those 300 tokens back eventually. Um, but if they don't get in, then they lose that stake. And uh, if someone thinks that they're good, great. You know, then they'll probably get in. But if someone thinks you know, you're going to be a malicious actor, then they can challenge that proposal. That's what this is. And um, so someone challenges. And then basically, at the end of, say, a 30-day period, um, this a person either makes it in or they don't. And if they make it in, they keep their, to their stake. If they, um, if they don't make it in, they lose it. And then in the end, you have a list of the good actors. So we've got Alice and Bob and Mallory and, and Trent in this case. Mallory and Trent are OK, which is kind of strange because she's the malicious actor and he's the trusted third party. But nonetheless, this is the, the, the registry. Um, so overall, this is Ocean. It's a decentralized data exchange, uh, a protocol to unlock data for AI. Um, and this actually has big benefits, kind of uh, circling back to the very beginning of the talk. First of all, it's squeezing out those centralized personal data silos, right? Very, very important. Um, if we don't do this, then we've got real problems on the internet, much worse than we have now. Um, in the case of the medical uh, healthcare case, uh, 100x more data for healthcare research, right? And there's an ongoing project we have related to Parkinson's there. Uh, some of you might have seen me write about tokenizing the enterprise, um, the idea where enterprises themselves can have tokens and then bit by bit melt into the community. Well, guess what? There's a step zero here. The step zero is to tokenize the data of the enterprise, right? Once the data of that enterprise is tokenized, then the other steps flow much more readily. I've talked about the self-driving car case, right? And this means fewer accidents, fewer lives lost, and greater mobility for many, many millions of people, right? We worked on this with Toyota. We continue to work with Toyota on this. The self-driving, self-owning cars. So once we have self-driving, why stop there? Why not let these cars own themselves, right? This is uh, what Chris's slide had as the decentralized autonomous corporation, right? Um, and this is a possibility. If you are Uber, um, are you going to, as you roll out for, um, your self-driving cars, are you going to spend the tens, the hundreds of billions of dollars to buy all those cars? probably a lot easier to stay capital efficient, remain just a platform company, and instead let the cars own themselves. And by the way, this is actually possible using laws out of Zug Switzerland. 
And once you have a few of these self-owning cars interacting, you have fleets of them, car swarms. And there's a speaker on that at this conference as well. So swarms of cars um, interacting, not only with, with themselves, but with electric charging stations and the rest of the environment. This isn't just about self-driving cars, it's also about self-owning power grids and all this other public infrastructure that is out there in the world, bit by bit by bit getting tokenized. This is going farther into the future, but this is sort of what this unlocks. There are pros and cons to this, there's um, negative things, but we have to be aware of this. Um, and uh, overall, it's quite exciting. And uh, Jan Peter Dornick, I believe he's speaking tomorrow, he um, inspired me to think of it this way. Um, we have a nature 1.0 where we have soil, trees, wind, flocks of birds. But if we have this new infrastructure for the planet um, that is out there that no one owns or controls, that we interact with, that provides us with mobility, with roads and so on, that's really a nature 2.0. What is it shaped like? It's internet, it's metal, it's AI, it's swarms of cars. How's that for an upgrade to the planet? So, let's conclude. Right now, data is siloed with no incentive to share, a shelling point that is pretty negative for humanity. But we can do something about it. We can equalize the opportunity for data access while retaining privacy. How? Opinionated AI and crypto tech. Ocean is a protocol for data marketplaces and, crucially, data commons. And overall, the result is an equal opportunity for data and value based on the value that you return, the income and so on. This is Ocean. We're in the early stages of Ocean. Uh, you will be seeing announcements um, in, the next, in the coming weeks and months on this. Um, we're very excited uh, about the opportunity to work with Toyota, um, Dex, and others as we take this journey. And if any of you guys are interested in this, please um, come talk to us and um, we can take this journey together. With that, I will wrap up and have questions. Thank you. So um, maybe we get some questions out there. Anyone? Any, there is someone? So maybe I just have to go in the crowd and spread the mic. Hi, uh, thank you for your talk. Hello. Uh, my question is how about not sharing the data, but sharing the model? So because model is the output of all this process and you just combine data with the AI company, but instead you can just distribute the model and uh, create that model over this participant, and then you, at the end you are going to have the model. Yeah. So. Um so that is actually a possibility, and in fact, we um, generalize the label of data from not just the raw data, but you can upgrade the data through various transformations, including machine learning. So, and then you can have models of models um, with things like begging and boosting, but also beyond. So um, there is opportunities here for, um, yeah, basically promoting the data to more and more levels of refinement, and that can fit within this, um, just for sort of a, a frame, to keep things simple in terms of framing, this is how we normally present, but you're absolutely right. Um, the data uh, can be the model itself. Thank you for the wonderful presentation. Big fan of Ocean, uh, thanks. Uh, have you guys talked to some of the big players or some who kind of monopolize their verticals? So what did they say? I see the logic when it comes to you know medium or smaller players. But, uh, but somebody who kind of <coughs> hoards their power at the moment, well, what's the response? Yeah, so um, a lot of large enterprises, um, they have tons of data, but they don't know how to monetize it. They, it's just sitting there uh, locked up, and they're really worried about like data protection laws and, and how to create value from it with AI, et cetera, right? So we're actually in talks with a lot of them because we actually have good answers to, to those questions. You know, we work very closely with several governments around data protection laws, um, and uh, we're working with several collaborators on um, different approaches to privacy in various shapes and forms, depending on what you need. So um, most of these uh, large organizations that we've dealt with, um, they're actually uh, quite open about this because they see that it can help them, right? Um, some of the, the organizations that are least interested in this, which we haven't in engaged with as much, are simply the ones that already have tons of data and the AI. Like, they have everything to lose here. And guess what? I want to take it from them. 
I'm serious. And I, I should also paraphrase, like, I don't want to take it from them for myself. I want to spread this power to the globe, just to be clear. <laughs> That's a fantastic talk. It's truly, it's, it's a paradigm shift. I'm amazed by it. But I wondered if, just really follow on question from the guy over there, is have you had any talks with broadcasters or internet publishers about um, doing this with their first party data and even going further than that and talking to the viewers and users of those platforms talk about how they might then be able to use their data and, and share it. Because that to me seems like, that's the, I do a lot of work with broadcasters and as soon as you mention data, they kind of kick you out of the building. And it's like getting over that and into some kind of you know, dynamic shared model of, of data sounds, you know, that would be fantastic. I just wondered if you'd explore that space at all. Yeah, so I, 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 maybe a bit, some of my colleagues have been doing a lot more of the business relations side, so um, I don't know myself um, if, if we have, but it makes a lot of sense. I absolutely agree. And um, if you would like to chat later, uh, that'd be great. And that's a question for you and for Chris uh, from Toyota. So um, the best uh, semiconductors for, uh, for car industry right now, so the Mobilia acquired by uh, Intel. The issue there is that Mobilia, um, Actually, the cameras they deploy on all the cars to, to record things and then to train uh, cars with those data. Uh, those data is owned uh, by Intel now, which uh, is a kind of uh, an issue for OEMs and ODMs um, designing and manufacturing cars. However, um, I was kind of, you know, uh, wondering why all those OEMs are not on your list because that would be a very natural, uh, you know, uh, see for them to dive into. So uh, what is the status there and uh, how do you interact with uh, semiconductor companies uh, also interested in data? Yeah, so I'll answer this in two parts about the sort of automotive ecosystem and the semiconductor. So automotive overall, um, uh, as Chris was uh, hinting at, there's uh, a lot of discussions uh, towards mo a movement where overall you have a lot of organizations that are pooling their data, but they're not doing it as in let's share data, let's sync them by uh, and stuff. They're actually going to pool their data via uh, data exchanges, right? So, um, and it doesn't have to be just the big autos, but it can be smaller places as well, players as well. A nice example is Comma.ai, which is, you know, one hacker in SF, right? But he actually has a smartphone that you attach to your dash, and you can put your data out there um, via the smartphone. It, will it be valuable in the end? The market can decide, right? And that's really wonderful. You can have super small players that start to try to nudge the market and prod it in new ways. Uh, with semiconductors, uh, I was in that industry for almost 20 years, of course, doing uh, CAD tools for AI. And uh, one challenge with semis is um, to make the most modern chips, these days it's 10 or 11 nanometers, um, it costs you about $10 billion to make that fab. So there's only actually three or four companies in the world that have the resources to do this, right? Intel being one of them, Samsung, TSMC, and UMC. And so we actually have, it's not very decentralized at that level, right? The good thing is, um, at least we have four players and not uh, one, right? And um, so, and if there was one, then Intel would run into um, antitrust laws. This is why they haven't killed AMD, because if they did, they would spend the next 15 years in court, right? So, um, th therefore, um, if, this, uh, if chips for automotive become very, very important, then we will see um, Intel and Samsung making their own, and then we will see the Qualcomms and NVIDIAs of the world making uh, a bunch of uh, chips and manufacturing those on TSMC, UMC, right? So uh, it's going to be relatively decentralized, uh, but we can't get around right now the fact that we have these $10 billion fabs. Yeah, yeah the fabless guys, but the fabless guys like Qualcomm, et cetera, um, they still have to manufacture, and they manufacture typically on TSMC and sometimes UMC, right? So any more questions? One last question, maybe? There we go, in the back, far right. There we go. Hello, Trent. Thank you for the talk. I was just um, uh, philosophizing in, uh, when this gets to a later stage and into a more mature state. Um, how do you see um, when there will be um, a demand for a performance when, you ha when we have this huge uh, decentralized database um, uh, running in terms of replication, accurate, accuracy of the data, um, and so on and so on. Um, have you thought about it uh, at all yet or not? Uh, so I guess um, to parse support your question, do you mean performance of the, the infrastructure building blocks like the decentralized database and whatnot or is it more yes, about accuracy? Yes. Okay. So to me, I come from the AI world and as you saw, um, 
in the AI world, a lot of the stuff initially was you know playing with five or ten variables and um, on small toy problems with small toy data sets. But people realized you would get way more accuracy if you actually had massive data sets, lots of variables, and so on. And once people realized that, then job scale was job one, right? And it has been that way ever since, um, in my case, in my career, since about 2003 or so. Scale is job one. In the world of crypto, most people are doing POCs on toy problems. And those POCs mostly don't get, go anywhere because they say, they realize they need to scale up 100x or 1,000x. And um, it's just a completely different tooling than they did for their POC. Big chain DB, scale is job one. It's a scalable blockchain database. Uh, we started with scale. We made sure um, that it has the scale. And we continue to improve. It's, it's not perfect yet, um, but we have, we have a long way to go still. But um, there, it, it has quite good performance already. And uh, we have people rolling out production applications. We just saw Michael Ray with Timelys, for example, doing this, right? So um, scale is absolutely important. Uh, you know, we can see the flip side, too, where you know, to conduct a single transaction in Bitcoin costs between $1 and $10, right? That's exactly. one entry into a database, right? Imagine if every time you typed a keystroke into your computer, it costed you $10, right? Uh, <laughs> so, um, but it, it has its own use cases, too, of course, to, to be fair to it. So overall, um, scale really, really matters. And the decentralization community is only just starting to realize this. Yeah, true. OK, thanks. Maybe I want to add something to that. Ocean is a protocol, not necessarily a data store. Yeah, so BigChainDB is a, P a building block of this, right? And um, one level up, Ocean is, um, you know, it points to the storage of the data, uh, but it, ha it uses several building blocks, right? The storage of the data, the st um, like the blobs, the data sets, as well as the metadata, the tokens, et cetera. And there's other pieces, too, like I pointed out. It's going to be more challenging when you do blobs on-premises. Probably oh yeah, no, actually, you will for sure. On, so this is, when you have on-premise, there's two reasons to have on-premise. One of them is um, for privacy, but the other one is massive data, right? Like, it's really, really heavy to move around. So in that case, this is where you might want to just simply do the computation on-prem, which is actually done a lot right now. Yeah. So it's the cost of, you know, the bandwidth and the time for the bandwidth versus um, bringing the compute in-house, in, in right? I think we'd love to share some thoughts uh, during the drinks in the foyer. Um, that's what's happening next, I guess. Uh, but first of all, let's give it up for Trent.